Welcome, bienvenidos, to today's core training on developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young, and we are your hosts and trainers today. As you can see and hear, our core institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team member Stella Lauerman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. I'll turn it back over to Nicole Young, who will get us started with a poll. Great, thanks, Nicole. It's good to see everyone here. We wanted to start off with a couple polls just to get a sense of who's in this virtual room. We know that some of you may be coming with some existing knowledge about theories of change and logic models, maybe just want a refresher or see if we have anything new to say. Others of you, this may be a new concept and, and are here to learn all about that. So tell us in this poll, and there's two questions in this poll, how would you rate your level of knowledge about developing a theory of change? Is it none, a little, some, or a lot? And how would you rate your level of knowledge about developing a logic model? Same response options, none, a little, some, or a lot. We'll leave this poll up to give everyone a chance to respond and then I'll close it and share the results so we can see who we're working with today. And this will help Nicole and me adjust some of our examples or content as we go through the this training uh, if we're able to or it'll just help us kind of know whether we can elaborate on certain things more or need to slow down at all and of course feel free as Nicole said to ask questions or share your comments in the chat throughout okay so it's looking like the poll responses have slowed down so I'm going to end the poll Share the results so we can see that looks like there's a, if we were to turn that chart uh, sideways, it would look kind of like your typical bell curve that we have a little bit of everything uh, today. And so there uh, is at least some of you who are saying that you have no knowledge about theories of change and logic models and some that have a lot and then there's some a lot of knowledge in between there. Okay, so that's helpful for us to know. Again, thank you for taking that time to answer these two uh, poll questions here. So here's our, our agenda for today. We wanted to start off giving an overview of core investments and the core institute for innovation and impact and the core request for proposals or RFP trainings and technical assistance that we're able to offer. Some of you, again, might already know some of this information, but we just want to make sure everybody is starting off with the same information. And then we'll spend the majority of our time walking through some tools and techniques and suggestions for developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. And we like to start off with this topic because we think it's really helpful and valuable, not only for preparing grant applications like the core applications, but just uh, program planning and evaluation in general, that uh, oftentimes these are tools and techniques that Nicole and I use in our own work and find that the more we do it, the more it becomes like a muscle that you build up. So we'll share some of what we know. We certainly encourage you, if you have a lot of knowledge or other ways of thinking about this, to share that as well during the training. And we will leave time for questions and discussion. Actually, we'll have opportunities for questions and discussion throughout and then we'll wrap up with our closing and next steps. And you know, today's topic might seem fairly straightforward for a training, and there will certainly be a lot of times when you'll be listening to us speak, but then we'll encourage, again, sharing and, and asking questions and some dialogue. So anytime that we do a, a training or a conversation or a dialogue, we like to start off with a set of agreements that we ask everyone to agree to and follow uh, that help create a brave and inclusive learning space. So again, was just, as we saw in the poll a moment ago, there's a range of, of pre-existing knowledge about these topics. We want this to feel like it's a, a good opportunity, good space to be asking all kinds of questions, 
even pushing back on some of the concepts we might be sharing if you think differently about them. But to do that, it helps if we can uh, follow some basic agreements. So the first one is to share the error. We love to have interaction in these trainings. Uh, it's, that's, it's so nice when someone wants to speak up first or get things started versus just having the awkward silence. We also just do encourage everyone to be aware of how much airtime or chat time that you might be taking up and just make sure, we wanna make sure there's opportunity for everyone's voice to be heard and recognized. We encourage you to lean into discomfort and take risks. So again, for some of you, it may feel like, oh, theory of change, logic model, love those things. And this feels very natural. Others. For others of you, it may feel like, oh, this is hard, or why do I have to do this? Or it's not being required, and this feels too rigid or too... So whatever those reactions might be, we encourage you to just notice that. And if you're having any of those feelings of discomfort, to really just kind of sit with it for a while. Don't try to immediately solve it and make it go away, because that's often where the learning comes, either for you as a participant or even for us as the trainers. We encourage everyone to speak from their own experience. Again, just recognizing that we have different levels of knowledge and experience and perspectives that are in this uh, virtual room today. We ask everyone to listen fully and be present. We know that sometimes people prefer to keep their cameras off or they need to keep cameras off or don't have a camera. We encourage you, if you do have a camera, to turn it on. We love to feel like we're interacting with real people, even though we're not physically seeing each other. Helps us get a sense of uh, kind of the participants in the room, how you're feeling about the content, make sure you're all still there. Uh, so if you're willing to do that, we would greatly appreciate it. And it just, again, helps us all stay present and not be too tempted to multitask. We encourage everyone to stay in that curious mindset, the learning mindset. If you hear us or someone else say something that doesn't quite sit well with you, uh, we encourage you to call everyone into the learning process versus calling each other out and making, you know, making each other feel wrong or dumb, you know, for saying something or asking a certain question. So learner's mindset helps too if we separate intent from impact. So we might say things or do things or ask things in a certain way that comes across as insensitive or even offensive. And uh, that if we can all come from the place of assuming that, that we all have good intentions, it can help, again, further that learning process um, and, and also be, really be mindful of our own choice of words and, and way we say it. We encourage everyone to honor confidentiality as well. We will, again, ask you for examples, uh, ask you, ask for volunteers to share what you came up with during the exercise. We get exercises we have you do in a few moments. Um, and it, so it might mean that you're sharing some information about your own organization, your own programs, maybe some of the discussions you've been having, maybe some of the challenges or sticking points. And so if you leave today's training and you want to share anything with others who didn't attend today, we ask you to share ideas, like the insights, the takeaways, and not the identities or IDs of the people that said it. And then last but not least, practice self-care. So we will build in a break today, but also if you need to do something else and it's not the official break time to take care of yourself, either stand and stretch or just turn off your camera for a while before you come back on, please do what you need to to take care of yourself. We know that this is a really busy time for everyone and this is probably, you know, a back-to-back -back <laughs> meeting day for many of you. So self-care is so important. Okay, so those are our agreements that we're asking everyone to follow. So let me just do a quick check to see how do these uh, feel to you? They feel like things that you can Hold yourself to help each other remember if you're noticing something happening. Thank you. I see some thumbs up. That really helps. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything that feels missing that you'd like to add to this list before we move on? I don't see any hands or I just mostly see thumbs up. If you think of anything, feel free to put it in the chat and we will... Make sure that we mention that and recognize that. 
Okay, so let's move on. Here's the quick overview of core investments, which some of you may, again, know already. Core is an evolving thing. <laughs> it has grown and evolved just in the last five years since it was first created and adopted as a funding model. We now think of it and describe it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And this definition and the mission and vision statement that you see here on the screen that has keywords like safe, healthy, equitable, well-being, resilient, those are statements that Nicole and I didn't just come up with on our own. They were developed with a lot of input from different agency partners and, and people like you that participated in, in a number of conversations to help us really think about, you know, what is CORE besides just a mechanism for, uh, for providing funding? So we really try to remind ourselves, you know, about the intent of the mission and vision. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent, interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. And that we get to a place where people's opportunities and their life outcomes can't be predicted for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, all those kinds of demographics or, or aspects of our social identities. And equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate and remind us that we have to acknowledge existing inequities and take explicit actions to create equitable opportunities and outcomes in those core conditions. And then in the core investments request for proposals or RFP, there's actually language in there that describes equity and gives some uh, helpful I think, guide, guide posts or guidelines around how, to, how CORE is define, defining equity in this particular funding opportunity. A lot of it, again, is based on all the work, all the discussions that have been happening over the last five years. So this is on page, it starts on page two of the RFP, if you wanna look that up for yourself too or refer back to it. Some of the key concepts in there are just that equity is central to core investments and it really compels us to identify populations within the county who may face particular obstacles to their health and well-being and then create solutions tied to their needs and to address the root causes of inequity. So it's about more than just providing more services, but really trying to get at what are the root causes of those inequities. And we think, of, we think of equity as both a process and a desired result or impact uh, in terms of core, and that we focus on anti-racism and racial equity explicitly, but not exclusively. And so again, that, that brings us back to what I was saying just a moment ago about, you know, when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that opportunities and outcomes aren't limited or predictable by things like age, race, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. So we often refer to these as equity dimensions. So dimensions of diversity, um, different aspects of equity. So in the request for proposals where it says, or it gives you the opportunity to define equity, it's not necessarily saying define equity as a concept or principle, it's asking you to identify what dimensions of equity will your program or project or proposal be addressing. Where do you see the needs? Where do you see inequities? How will your proposal address those? So I just wanted to mention that up front so that as we then move through and talk about creating a theory of change and logic model, that you can think today about you know, which dimensions of equity or, or, or aspects of equity uh, are important in your area of work. And all of these trainings, I mean, many of you, I know, because I, I recognize your names and your faces, you know, you've attended several core institute events like coffee chats, core conversations, uh, other events and town halls that we've co-hosted. So the, all of the trainings and TA sessions that we're offering related to the core RFP are part of the core institute. 
Um, and so we, Nicole and I are going to have very busy <laughs> next six to eight weeks as, as well as all of you. And just wanted to say a little bit about our role in providing this training in TA. Um, so again, this is uh, related to the core RFP that was released on November 16th, due on February 4th. And you can find the core RFP, the application forms, the information about how to use the online application portal called Reviewer. You can find all of that and the schedule of training in TA on the Human Services Department's website. And Gisela is going to post that link in the chat for us in a moment. Hopefully you've already discovered it, but we'll put it there again. And again, you can find the whole calendar of training and technical assistance on the website, all the registration links. And so Nicole and I are providing training TA pretty much almost right up until the deadline, um, you know, either through the trainings like this that are structured presentations. Uh, they have, you, you'll know it's a training if it has a particular title and topic that's described. So feel free to sign up for any or all of those trainings that we're offering over the next uh, couple of months. We're also offering a number of group office hours sessions where we won't be presenting anything formal or structured, like we're not designing trainings for those. It's more, here's an hour where if you have questions, you want help brainstorming, you want to talk with your peers about things, sign up for those as many office hour sessions as you want. And we'll work through questions and brainstorming together as a group. And then we're also offering, oops, I forgot to fix that typo, the one-on-one -on -one TA <laughs> sessions where you can sign up for individualized assistance. And at this point, we're saying uh, everyone can sign up for one individual TA session per application. So if you're doing multiple applications, you can sign up for multiple one-on-one -on -one TA sessions. Um, at this point, because we want to make sure that everyone who wants a one-on-one -on -one TA session can sign up for one, we're limiting it to just one per application. If it looks like everybody that wants to sign up for one has already signed up for one and we still have more slots available, we'll let everybody know. And just a couple more things. Nicole and I, you know, we're, we're going to try to stay away from giving any kind of direct advice or editing of your proposals like oh you should really say it this way or or oh you should implement your program this way we're going to try to stay away from that kind of ta and really just help you think through and understand how to use some of the tools that are available as you're developing your proposals so we might ask you you might be asking us questions and then in turn we'll ask you a lot of like coaching questions to help you arrive at your own answers and decisions um, and just to also make it clear Nicole and I aren't going to be involved at all in selecting the people that will be reviewing the proposals and scoring them. We're not involved at all in that aspect of the panels and review process. We're not involved at all in the discussions about funding recommendations and who should get funding and how much, because we really want to stay in this role of providing assistance to all of you. Okay, I'm going to pause, take a, a breath. And just see, does anybody have any questions so far? If you have any questions, feel free to, again, to put them in the chat. This is just a little summary of the trainings, again, the, the structured trainings. I have a topic where we'll cover certain tools and concepts. And you can sign up, again, for all the trainings, the group office hours on the Human Services Department's website at that link there. There's a different Google sheet we're using to have people sign up for the one-on-one -on -one TA sessions. That allows us, Nicole and I, uh, just more flexibility to kind of see who, who's signing up for what and, and then send you the calendar invite. If you have any questions about the training and technical assistance, you can email Nicole and me at our email addresses, Nicole at opti-solutions.com and Nicole at lesson at mindspring.com. Any questions about the actual RFP, the application, the online application portal, all, all those kinds of, we call them like the technical questions, those should be directed to the county at corefunding at santacruzcounty.us. Gisela, if you don't mind putting those email addresses in the chat, that would be great. 
Okay, so that was our little overview of core. So let's move on and talk about this idea of developing a theory of change. And I'll just say, I'll just preface it by saying, again, we offer this as a tool and we have, you know, worksheets or we have those handouts that hopefully everyone got in the reminder email and had a chance to, to print them out. Um, we're, we're big fans of taking tools that are available and then use them however they fit best. So if there's something in that worksheet that you're feeling like, oh, that's not how I would say it, or that doesn't exactly work for me, like make it your own. Do it, do what you want to so that it is a helpful tool for you. But we'll walk through suggestions and, and tips for how to use these kinds of tools and then give you a chance to practice using them. Okay, and we and we're gonna start with a little bit of humor, because sometimes these trainings can get so serious. Um, but so this is, we like to use this one because, you know, it happens to, it happens to all of us. Like Nicole and I have also been on the other end, like your, in your shoes, where we're the ones applying for funding for something and, and experience the same kind of dynamic, right? Where, um, you know, often there's kind of this black box where the magic happens, right? But it's not really clear, like what's inside that box or what, it, how, how does that magic actually happen? All we know is that without funders, without evaluation, this is often how things look. To funders, right? That we're, we're asking for, for more money to make the magic happen. It's not really clear what that is or how it happens or what to expect. Um, but we just keep asking, right? Like we need more money to do, you know, to, to make the magic work. And so we think of a theory of change and a, and a logic model as tools to help really understand and explain and demonstrate how you make that magic happen. Um, and so that's kind of how we encourage you all to think about these tools. So again, the worksheets we sent out, uh, we have them available in both English and Spanish. We encourage you, especially if anyone is thinking about applying for the targeted impact grant, or just as part of your program model, you uh, engage and work with community members, uh, you know, community members that you are serving, that they are part of your planning process. We encourage you to share these kinds of tools with them or, or just use them as a way to have a dialogue if they're part of a planning process. So we wanted to make sure that they're also available in both English and Spanish. And really what it comes down to is a theory of change and logic model helps you express and articulate what you're doing and why. And so if you can answer those questions and tell that story in a really compelling way, that can make funding proposals really stand out and make it really clear for reviewers like, oh, this is what they're doing. Here's the need that they're addressing. Here's what they expect will happen if they provide this particular program or service. You want reviewers to like read it and be like, I get it, right? So that's what we'll be guiding you through today. So, and we'll start with the theory of change, which really addresses the second part of that question, the why part, what are you doing and why? And so there's three parts that we'll walk through, creating a, a problem or need statement and describing the context and then describing your hypothesis or ideas about solutions. And throughout all of that, the, a recurring question to keep asking is what data do you have or will you need to support your theory of change. So the first part there, the problem or need statement, um, just want to clarify that it's, you know, it's a the societal or social problem or need that you are concerned about or that you see needs to be addressed. And it's also describing who is experiencing it or who's affected by it. And are some people affected more than others? So that's where we get to disparities and inequities. And I just want to be clear too that, you know, when we talk about a problem or a need statement, we're not talking about, we want to make sure that we're not defining that or describing that in a way where it's then, oh, the people are the problem, or that it's, you know, a problem with, you know, people's skills or motivation level or, or their characteristic, characteristics, that we're describing, you know, an issue, right, that needs attention and what data helps explain that. And then we pair that with 
a description of the context, like what are those root causes and, and what's contributing to that. So problem or need and what data. And so we'll show you some, some, some sample language, like of what that might look like as you think about or write out a theory of change. This was in, the, in one of the handouts I sent in the email. And again, I'll just say that, you know, what we'll be showing you are <clears throat> some examples with fully formed sentences, just because we took the time, <laughs> we had the time to write them out and think through an example. For today, we encourage you to just jot down notes as you're listening to me to describe the examples, when you get to the part where we give you a chance to try it yourselves. Very rarely does a theory of change come out in full, complete sentences first time around. So oftentimes it's about just getting the ideas out and then seeing, okay, what else do I need to be thinking about? Who else should I be talking to? Who else should be part of this conversation? Okay. So in our example, we're going to use the issue of childhood obesity. And so when we think about how to frame the societal or social problem or need, here's an example. And we're <clears throat> starting off with a strengths-based perspective. Healthy eating and physical activity habits in childhood contribute to lifelong health benefits. So we're starting up front with the benefits or, or strengths. While unhealthy habits increase the chances of developing health problems like obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Okay, so we do wanna be clear that there is an issue to address. Otherwise, if you can't clearly state or articulate what a problem or need is, it, it could raise the question like, well, so why, why is your program needed? Or, or why should your program get funded? That's an example of a, how to think about or frame or describe a, a societal problem or need. And then in terms of who's affected and inequities. So here again, using the same example, we're describing how we're, we're using the rates of uh, students who are at a healthy weight and are physically fit in Santa Cruz County, comparing that to state averages overall, and calling out that that's not true for all groups of kids. So here we're using a racial equity lens. So the in terms of those equity dimensions, we're using race and ethnicity. So in our county, that next kids are less likely to be at a healthy weight or physically fit. And then if we're gonna make statements like that or, or name a problem or need, we wanna be ready with some data that helps back that up to say, okay, well, it's not just my opinion or it's not just you know based on what one person told me, but uh, what, uh, what data is available and, and what we're showing here is data that we pulled from DataShare Santa Cruz County, which is a, a relatively new online platform that has all kinds of countywide data uh, that we encourage you to explore. And we'll cover more of that in one of our upcoming trainings. So again, thinking about what data do you have to help explain or help a reader really understand and, 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 and understand kind of the extent and the nature of the, um, the problem statement. But then we don't want to stop there. And especially because we don't want to send the message like, again, that it's, oh, it's, it's, the people's fault, or it's that group of people that are somehow a problem. But we really want to then look at, well, why? Why is that happening? And why are there disparities? So this, when you think about a context in a theory of change, this is our chance to think about and identify our assumptions about why the problem exists. What are some of those causes or contributing factors? And again, really pushing ourselves to think about the systemic barriers. What are the things in terms of policies or practices, uh, laws, you know, funding <laughs> practices, you know, all of it, including our own, you know, within our own organizations that might actually be contributing to or perpetuating some of those um, concerning outcomes, the disparities based on, you know, race or ethnicity or gender or, you know, whatever the equity dimensions are. So again, thinking about what are those systemic barriers and causes. And also then balancing that out with thinking about well, what are the strengths and assets and protective factors that are also present and might actually help combat or change some of those causes and, and barriers. So that's, that's what I mean by context. And again, ask the question, what data do you have or will you need to support 
your description of the context. So here's an example using the same childhood obesity example. So we think about causes or systemic factors. Some examples might be, oh, maybe it's a lack of access to healthy or healthier choices. Maybe it's just really hard to for um, people living in certain areas of our community to get to places that sell fresh produce or healthy food options. Um, another kind of systemic factor could be that free and low cost foods are often, you know, the free and low cost food choices are often also the ones that are less healthy. So if, uh, if economic security is an issue and, and one of the causes or contributing factors, oftentimes it means that food choices, right, are more restricted. It's also just, it can be difficult to change habits, right? Or there might be a lack of support from friends or family, like for someone trying to make um, changes in eating or, or physical activity habits that if everyone else is still doing something else, it can be hard to make changes. So that's what I mean by thinking about a range of causes and systemic factors, not just individual, but also again, kind of community and, and system level. And here are some examples of ways to think about strengths and assets and protective factors. You know, maybe you know that there's increased interest in among people to grow their own food, right? And through community gardens or uh, or growing native foods, right? And if we think about as a protective factor, making the healthy choice the easy and affordable choice, it could point to or open up different possibilities about where changes could happen, whether it's in things like school meals, you know, vending machine options, the accessibility and safety of walking trails and parks. Um, and then, you know, they're just acknowledging that there may be, you know, a strong base of encouragement from friends and family, and, and that could be something to build on. And again, thinking about in terms of context, and this is just an example, we think about, well, what data might be needed? Potentially something like focus group data from local students. Maybe you already have that. Maybe it's something that you're feeling, like, oh, we have all this, other, all this other data, but we're missing that piece in terms of like the youth voice. So how could we uh, make sure we include some include that? Maybe you're realizing, well, we have some good local data, but what have other communities found? So either if it's from their own research studies or evaluation studies or um, other data, you might find it helpful as part of the context to look at that. And again, I'll just say like, we're we, we wanted to include a number of examples in each of these areas, just to give you a sense of different ways to think about this. We're not all suggesting like, come up with a you know huge laundry list of all these additional things you now need to start doing. So just, um, if, you know, even if you only decide that there's one thing, you know, one piece of data or um, one data point that you want to highlight, that's all good as well. And then, so again, once we've identified a, a problem or need statement, really thought through the context, then we can think about solutions, meaning what is your hypothesis about effective strategies, programs, and practices? They might be strategies and programs practices that you already implement. And so you might just be going through this exercise to make sure that you can clearly articulate, you know, why your particular approach and, and services are a good fit or are part of that solution. You might be like, if you're developing a new program and you're not really sure, this is your chance to think through, okay, given the, you know, problem and need statement, given the context, what would be some, ideas or possibilities around strategies, programs, and practices. And again, asking what data do you have or what will you need to support that? So here again, we have some examples. So let's say you, again, have thought through the whole problem statement context. Maybe your hypothesis is, if we make the healthy choice easy or easier, and affordable choice, we can encourage healthy eating and physical activity and improve outcomes for all local youth while closing disparities in outcomes. So you can see that this is the way we phrased it here. It's a pretty broad and general statement. It's not necessarily about, oh, this particular program will improve those outcomes and close those disparities. That was just our that was just kind of a stylistic choice that we made in this example. You might find in your own theory of change that you are 
uh, explicitly saying we think our particular program or approach is the solution. So that that's fine too. Um, so there's the hypothesis we have, you know, here we have a little bit of what we call targeted universalism, that idea that you have this goal to improve outcomes for all, that your strategy will benefit everyone, and you're also explicitly working to close disparities where you see them in different equity dimensions. So that's what that concept of targeted universalism is. And part of your hypothesis might be recognizing or naming opportunities to do something different or enhance what you're doing <clears throat> to be part of the solution. So here our example is we have an opportunity to work with a group of students who are motivated to change behaviors among their peers and push for better policies in their school, neighborhood, and community. So here we wanted to show in, in our example the combination that could be, you know, something that involves some kind of a direct service or direct pro program, as well as some of the policy advocacy kind of work. And again, this, even when you develop your hypothesis, it can lead to questions or it should lead to questions about, okay, do we need any additional data? This might help inform the way you think about how you go about measuring your outcomes and what evaluation tools or methods you need. So in our example, we're saying, oh, we need data on the actual barriers and obstacles that get in the way of healthier eating and physical activity for youth. So that ties us back to you know, focus groups. But we also wanna then say, <clears throat> how, are, how, do, how do those barriers, how, do the, how does the information we're getting, how does that differ by race and ethnicity, age and or gender? So again, we're being explicit and intentional about looking at data through that equity lens, you know, thinking about different dimensions of equity. And then part of the data, you know, in our example, we're saying that that would lead us to ask, or we might need more data about which ones are most, which issues and barriers are most relevant to the school setting to be addressed by school policies and which are most relevant in a home or neighborhood setting, because there might be different approaches or different policies or programs that are needed. Okay, so we wanna give you a chance to try it. Uh, and use your blank handout. Um, and does anyone, I see, I'm seeing the chats. Um, does anyone need, I will put the link to the, we've also got them on, on Google. So if anyone wants to click on the link to try to get to those. Thank you, Gisela. Uh, okay, so Gisela just put in the link to a Google folder where you can also find the slides and the handouts that we sent that I sent in the email. So if, if you want to do a quick download of the of the handouts, look for the one that has the that says examples in the title. There's both a blank worksheet and the examples if you want to look at those. And so what we're going to do first of all. Stop my screen share for a moment just to see if anyone has questions about what I just went through. And then we'll give you some time to work through it on your own. So any, any questions about a th how to develop a theory of change using the tool and the worksheet that we shared? Okay. So, oh, Chris, go ahead. I just had a, a question about the data statements, where in both the context and the solution sections, the data statement is basically saying, we don't have the data now, this is the data that we need. And is that part of the, maybe you can talk a little bit about more about that, because I'm a little confused. You don't have to have that data. You're saying part of the reason I'm looking for funding is so I can gather that data. Is that correct? It could be. Yeah. So it's both uh, what data do we have or do we need in order to help support or back up our theory of change? So if we're saying that this is a need or a concern in the community, how do you know? And it might be that you already have the data. And so you're that's a chance to describe that. It might be that you're realizing 
but we don't know for sure. But here's how we would go about getting it, and that's part of our proposal, or or it might be part of what you're trying to scramble to do before, <laughs> before as you're preparing your proposal. Um, or Chris, could I just add, you know, for example, you might have data that say this is the situation in our county or our state or this population, but your program is seeing something different, or you have you know, you have some experience that is telling you that maybe the, the data that are available aren't telling the whole story. That's often the case. And so maybe you have an insight that you want to explore. Is that, is, is what you're seeing um, something that's common across other, other populations and groups? You want to explore it a little bit? Is it something that the more traditional data that are being collected perhaps are just missing because they're not asking? the same questions you are or seeing the same people you are. So they're just, we just didn't want to limit it to, you can only develop a theory of change or a logic model based on existing data because existing data are great when they work for you, but there are often gaps. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, I'm gonna set a timer. We're gonna give you about eight minutes to work through, get as far as you can to kind of think. And again, you might just jot down incomplete sentences or bullet points or phrases about the problem or need statement, the context, the solutions. So if you don't get all the way through it or don't feel like you have a fully flushed out theory of change at the end of the eight minutes, that's completely understandable. That would be expected. Uh, but then we'll, when the eight minutes up, we'll ask if anyone would be willing to share their what they came up with, and then we'll see if there are at least a couple people that want to share. And then we'll see if there are any additional questions or feedback that comes up out of that process. So I'm going to turn on some background music, just so we have something going on while you're thinking and writing. Okay, I have turned the music down. And so why don't we take a moment, and again, if, if you're willing to come back on camera so we can see your lovely faces, we would love that. And I'm gonna ask if anyone would be willing to talk us through your theory of change, however rough or raw it might be. What is a, uh, maybe we can just kind of break it down by step by step. And we'll start with um, just asking for examples. You can either say it out loud or put it in the chat. What are some of the societal issues or problems or concerns that you chose or identified for this exercise? Okay, yes, I'll please. volunteer. Um, so I'm currently wearing the hat um, of I'm the president of the Live Oak Education Foundation and we're parent run and our board is entirely white, yet we represent Live Oak. So my needs um, societal problem, well I just have my brainstorm notes in front of me, is we have a lack of voice from the community um, in determining funding priorities. Um, primarily from parents of color, uh, most notably the and so I wrote for my statement, I have yours up, let me see just a second. For my statement, I put that the societal problem was that communities of color are often excluded from decision-making tables and thus decisions made for their community do not reflect the of those community members. Um, if you want me to keep going, I, I did the who. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't get very far. I only got that first box. So um, so the second one, the who experiences slash is effective. I wrote, though the Live Oak Education Foundation is based on the belief that students deserve equitable access to educational experiences, we have not created a system that equitably collects the input from parents of color, specifically Spanish-speaking parents, on what experiences they want for their children. And then the data would be, and I haven't filled in the numbers yet, but um, the percent of the Live Oak School District 
population that is English learners and the percent of Live Oak School District students that are non-white. And then the fact that our leadership meetings are run and attended by white people and they're entirely in English as well as the materials. But that's the first, I'm so insecure about logic models as the other Nicole knows. So I am so open to feedback if I'm on the right track. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, Stacey, for um, volunteering to share and to say it out loud and um, and because it, it can be scary, right, to <laughs> be the one to give your example in a group training. So thank you for that. And, you know, everyone's theory of change is going to look different, right, and have a different focus or different way of describing things. I thought just the little bit that you shared with us is a really good start. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about what you just shared is that it, it's very local, right? It's very specific to, um, you know, the particular issue or thing that, that you're working on that you're concerned about. And I th so that was a great example to be able to share because um, there are some aspects of what, you know, I think we shared in, in the example around childhood obesity, you know, in our example a moment ago, that could feel a little global and abstract. Like it's very high level, like you just brought it right down to, yeah, here's what we're seeing. Right. And here's here, not just here's what we're seeing, but then here are some of the implications of that. Um, I think I heard you mention too, your audio was cutting, I think, a little bit in and out, but I think you were sharing in terms of data that you would look for things like or plug in numbers like English learners compared to uh, uh, white students, or I'm not sure if I caught all of that. But that's just another example, a great example too, of how in your first pass or your first run through, right? You, you might not have the numbers, <laughs> you know, readily available, but you know, oh, I should look to see if that kind of data is available because that helps explain or it helps round out the problem statement. So I thought that was well done. So thank you for that. Um, and Karen, I see also shared in the chat, high US incarceration rates are exacerbated by the highest recidivism rates in the world. Wow, in the world. And California has the highest recidivism rates in the nation. The problem is huge, growing, and disproportionately impacts low-income people and men of color. It's got some great statistics there. One of three African Americans, one out of five Latinos, one of 13 American men will be incarcerated or under court supervision at any point in time. Yeah, and the data is well known. Yeah, everyone, everyone knows the data, and yet it still persists, right? And so... Yeah, so great. Again, a really strong start there. I know that you're really skilled in doing these kinds of things too, Karen. You have a lot of experience in the in this. Uh, so thanks for sharing that example. It's a, a great, it's really helpful to be able to see, right, a variety of examples of how you might articulate or develop a theory of change. Would anyone else be willing or like to share their beginnings of a theory of change? Or did this raise additional questions for anybody as you were going through it? I saw a question come through in a private chat, and I think I might need to ask some clarification about the question. Let me find it. The question is something about How do you quantify client reporting issue as part of data collection? If that was your question, would, any, would that person be willing to either say a little bit more about that question out loud or in the chat? I think actually that person has left, so we'll follow up with that person later to see how we can help answer that question. Okay, any, does anybody else here have questions about a theory of change? How to use this kind of a tool? Can you see yourselves using this as you keep moving along with your core applications or other funding applications? It's not just specific to core, but it's a tool that can be used in a lot of different uh, situations. Okay. We are going to take a screen break at this point. We'll take about a, an eight-minute screen break.
come back at 10 after two, and then Nicole Lesson's going to pick it up from there, talk about how you then go from developing a theory of change to then building out a logic model. So unfortunately, the dog woke up during the break. <laughs> Let's see if we can get her to be calm for just a little longer. Um, so when Nicole mentioned the theory of change and the uh, examples that you shared, we want to emphasize again that this is a situation with both the theory of change and the logic model where the perfect is the enemy of the good. It's just important to start somewhere and start thinking about what's behind your assumptions about your program and its effectiveness and what's going to change in, in uh, the services you provide and the people that you're working with. So there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong way or perfect way to do this. And as Nicole said at the outset, different parts of this might speak to you more than others. But whatever you do, we just hope this will be helpful in thinking about not just this RFP, as Nicole said, but your work in general. And often theories of change and logic models are as important internally as they are to an external audience. So sometimes it just is helpful to understand how uh, much consensus or alignment there might be within your organization about what you think are the reasons why you're doing what you're doing, the whys of what you're doing, as well as the what's, what, what comes in a sequence, which is what we're going to talk about now with the logic model. So lots of different ways to use these and don't, please don't get hung up on what goes in which box, what gets called this terminology or that terminology. It's really just about trying to lay out your assumptions in as clear a way as possible so that you can explain them to others and also update your own thinking and see where there might be things that have changed in your understanding of what you're doing, the, the data that you have available to you, the insights, et cetera. So I um, hope that helps um, defray any angst that you're feeling about these tools. And also just a reminder, these, th these particular um, products are not required for these for the core RFP, they are purely thinking and planning tools, but we do we find them helpful in our own work, as Nicole said, and so we hope you will too. Okay, that being said, all the caveats. Um, so they can be as as uh, complicated or as simple as you wish, and we're going to just talk through some of the basics so that you can play with them a little more. So a logic model has some. Um, some common features. So it, it really just tries to answer the what part of what are you doing and why, whereas the theory of change was focused more on the why part. And so we have, all of us, no matter what kind of work we're doing, we have something we bring to it, some resources or in logic model speak, um, inputs. So those are the things that we have in place, and we'll talk about those more in just a moment. And when we devote those resources to our work, we have some outputs from that, some activities, some things that happen for the people who participate in our work. And so inputs lead to outputs, and usually those are in the near term. You can point to them and say, I started doing this, and here's what happened. But then the reason that you're doing that is so that you can have some other type of outcomes down the line. So you might have some in the short term and you can decide what that is. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's a year and a half, but relatively soon you have some outcomes that you're expecting that you'll achieve because of all those activities and investments that you're making. And then after that, you'll have those in turn leading to some other intermediate or medium term outcomes. And then some that are further out, probably several years away um, and maybe even longer than that, maybe even a decade. So all of this is lined up in time, what happens now, how it affects what happens next, what goes on from there. And so if the, the linear uh, time-based part of that doesn't work for you, you know, some people have tried to do logic models that are more iterative um, and, and circular and go for it. I mean, what, whatever helps you line up or, or explain or show the thinking behind what you're doing is what this is about, as opposed to a particular graphic or order or model. So as I said, for inputs, and these are the resources that you're bringing to your work, you might have some funding in place. Maybe it's from one source, maybe it's from multiple sources. With that funding, you have organized a configuration of staff. Maybe you have some volunteers associated with your organization and your work. 
Um, maybe that ratio is different for, for you now than it was in the past. Maybe you have others, partners, consultants, et cetera, working with you. And those are all resources that you bring um, to this work and deploy in different ways. Maybe you have other things um, working for you and with you, like uh, different uses of technology. Maybe you have some kind of um, training in place that is helping people do things in a different way. Maybe you have um, a reputation, a track record, um, some sense of goodwill um, that is particularly important to what you're doing. So for example, that you have a, um, a trust with the, the people that you're working with that others may not enjoy in the same, at the same level or the same way, that would be a type of input or resource that you have. And so you're gonna take all the resources that you have and that list can change over time and, and at the, as you get some feedback on it. But with those resources, you're going to plan and um, pull off some set of activities. And so maybe those are, depending on what you're doing, you're doing something like maybe you're offering counseling or access to a particular type of help. Maybe you're doing classes that help people gain information or skills or access. Maybe you are offering um, services to a particular population or on a particular topic or something that helps move the, um, the people you're working with towards a different status uh, through the, the types of assistance that you can provide. Maybe you are working in um, one of the areas of engagement in a community like the arts or advocacy for a particular cause. And maybe you are just um, helping people do whatever they do in a different way. Many, many possibilities for the activities represented just on this call, not to mention in our community at large, but those are the kinds of outputs. So they're, they're near-term activities that you could point to and tie very closely to the resources that you have deployed. And you're doing those activities with and for someone. So maybe there is a population that you're working with that is a particular age group, uh, race, ethnicity, um, other characteristics like immigration status or the LGBTQ plus community. Maybe it's for people in a particular situation like those lacking shelter. Um, maybe you are working um, not with people we would consider clients or consumers of services, but with partners. Maybe you're in a type of coalition that together try to do this kind of work. And maybe you're targeting your work through advocacy or other means at policymakers because you're trying to achieve a different kind of change in people's lives through a system. And through all of that work, all of the resources that you're devoting to this, the short-term outcomes that you're trying to achieve from those activities might be the kinds of changes that you're starting to see in, in different ways in people's uh, level of awareness, their knowledge of, of a problem or, an, or a solution, their attitudes towards their, their ability to address that situation, and their skills, because people don't um, necessarily move to a different realm of health status, for example, overnight. So you're trying to build some sense of awareness or knowledge or attitudes, motivation, confidence to do something, and the skills that go with that. So those might be reasonable short-term outcomes that are different from the classes or interventions or activities that you offer as your shorter, your very immediate outputs, but they're starting to, you're starting to see some change. So if you think about these as um, the depth of change, the scope of change, these are things that are reasonable to achieve with enough um, resources and effort and planning within some shorter term time frame that you've defined. And then if you keep going with those efforts, so those activities have built to short-term outcomes and those short-term changes, they may not all happen at the same time, but you're starting to get some traction and moving towards them. Then you're gonna start to see some intermediate outcomes and those are more ambitious still. So again, they're not, you're not jumping to those, but you're building to those step by step. And you're, you'll start to see things that might be changes in behaviors or status that are um, harder to achieve, but can but are achievable if you are doing your um, your activities 
your efforts, your planning in a certain way. And so you're headed towards those and you don't know exactly when they're gonna happen, but you expect that those will happen in a progression after your activities and short-term outcomes. So for example, if we're sticking with a health example, you might have classes that tell people about access to a certain type of health education service or convince them that there's something they can do about X type of health problem, but the, they're not ready yet to actually make those changes or use that preventive health service. But when you get to the intermediate outcomes, you have achieved that, but you've done it in a way that has built towards that, it hasn't happened overnight. And you could say the same about any type of social engagement or connectedness, things that move towards literacy, where you might have some steps ahead of that. Housing stability um, might be fragile at first and then achieve more permanence with, with uh, some of these intermediate outcomes being achieved. Physical activity, the habit forming part, um, water conservation and environmental actions and civic engagement. So you might, um, it might take a while to get people to participate in, in a program or system, but once they do, then you, you feel like you can move towards more of these changes in behavior and status. And then after you've done the activities, the short-term outcomes and the longer term uh, and the intermediate outcomes, then you are moving towards these long-term outcomes. And these are ones that are even more aspirational, but you're moving towards them in terms of changing the underlying conditions, like the core conditions that we talk about a lot, the circumstances, the environment that surrounds people so that they do have not just the information, the awareness, the skills and the motivation, but actually the opportunity to achieve um, optimal health status, to achieve their educational goals, to be ready for a different kind of work um, that gives them better economic stability or mobility, to increase resilience, not just in an individual, but across a, a generation or a population or, or a, a family system to have a greater sense of belonging um, and civic engagement as opposed to a one-off uh, voter participation drive and similar versions of this for things like climate change um, activism and, and involvement, resiliency, the, the way that neighborhoods can change to be safer um, and that housing can be more accessible and affordable. All of these things take years and take a lot more time than any single program can achieve but the idea is that individual programs working together can contribute to these kinds of long-term outcomes. So you are trying to show where your short-term activities and outcomes feed into these longer-term outcomes, not that you are responsible as an individual or an organization for achieving them on your own. So we've been talking about the progression in time from your resources and activities immediately the things you can see next month or next week and then next year and then a few years out and then maybe a decade out but another way to do this is called backwards mapping and that's just what it sounds like starting at the other end of the logic model with the impact or long-term outcomes that you want to achieve so in this example let's say our long-term goal is that youth are ready for life for college for career for whatever comes next for them and in order to get there, we ask ourselves, what has to happen before that long-term outcome is achieved? Well, we need some intermediate outcomes. So if youth are going to be ready for all those things, for life, for college, for career, then they need to, and you can insert whatever you think goes there. And in order to do that, then they also need to know or understand or be able to do something, X, Y, and Z. So you could insert what you think goes there. And in order to get to those short-term outcomes, first, we're gonna have to increase their knowledge about X, Y, and Z so that they can access these activities or services that might lead them there. So ideally, your logic model is logical, whether you go from activities through the short-term and intermediate outcomes to the long-term ones, or the other way around, starting with the long-term and working your way back. And this should make sense to anybody who picks it up. So it might be somebody who's not as familiar with your program, like a grant reviewer, or it might be somebody on your board of directors, 
a new hire, a partner, a colleague. So the whole idea is that somebody could look at this and as Nicole said, their reaction will be, okay, I get it. I get why you're doing these activities to ultimately get to those long-term goals or contribute to them or vice versa. I get why you are so interested in this long-term outcome and what you're doing now to get there. So many ways to slice and dice these, but it's all just about saying how what you're doing in the present with the resources that you have and the information that you have relates to this future state that you hope you will achieve. So questions, reactions, clarifications, hoping to make logic models feel a little more logical. And really um, to move through these, what you wanna ask yourself is if I do this, then what will happen? So if then questions, if I do this, then what? Then what can I expect? And it doesn't mean that you have a crystal ball and you know exactly what's gonna happen. I mean, we all know from the last couple of years, lots of curve balls um, that very few saw coming or didn't play out the way anybody had hoped. But the idea is to be prepared for different scenarios and to have a sense of, um, of an expectation, a reasonable expectation of if I do this, then these other things are likely. Or And if they don't happen, then you have an opportunity to ask yourself, why not? Why didn't the short and intermediate term outcomes that I anticipated and worked so hard to achieve why did they not unfold that way or not unfold all at once? That's an interesting set of questions and an opportunity for learning as well, not a failure. It is an, an or in most cases, I should say, not a failure. It is an opportunity to say, wow, we thought X would happen, but this other thing interfered and we didn't realize that. And now we're going to learn from it so that when we do our next set of outcomes, we'll be better informed and better prepared. So if you treat this as a way to uh, maybe wipe the, the dust or mud off that crystal ball and see things a little more clearly, that's another way to use logic models. I like to think of them almost like you're holding up a scroll and it's scrolling towards you in time. And as you get closer, things are getting a little more clear, um, both in terms of what's possible and also in terms of what obstacles you may have encountered that you can now um, overcome because you see them more clearly. So hopefully that demystified logic models just a little bit for you. And now we're gonna do the same thing that we did with the theory of change. So the theory of change is explaining why you think something will happen and how it would unfold. And the logic model is saying what you're going to do to make that theory of change come true. So, Get out the blank piece of paper or the blank worksheet, whatever you're working with, and maybe just start with one short-term outcome and see what, where that takes you. Um, again, you don't have to have a ton of these to be useful. And just start pull one thread and see where it goes. Or maybe you're a backward mapping person. Maybe you have the big vision and you want to see how you, how you work that way see what comes before that and before that and before that. And pretty soon you'll be in late 2021 looking at the next few months. Any questions before diving in? Okay. Oops, I'm gonna do that, sorry. Hyper mouse. Okay, so I'm going to stop my sharing. Nicole and I will be here for questions in the chat or raise your hand. We're gonna take another eight minutes or so to play with the logic models. And then surprise, surprise, we'll ask for volunteers to share an insight from this process. So just don't, don't get too stuck on um, what goes where and just, just play out something that you're doing now and what it could lead to or vice versa, something you hope to achieve and what has to happen at various intervals before that to, to make it happen. 
Okay, does, um, does anyone have an example they'd like to share of at any point on the logic model or an insight of a way that you got there or a gap it might have revealed? What, what was this like? I can continue my sharing from before. That would be um, great, Stacy. Thank you. This helped me unpack what I thought involvement and voice represented. I, I, I thought that was just it, but really it's awareness. <laughs> Do they know we exist? Is it interest? Do they have any interest in being involved? Mm -hmm. um, is it, um, it there's the, the difference between participating as, a, as an outcome. Um, attendance is different than participation, which is different than volunteer involvement. Um, and then I realized when I was looking at the core conditions that we fit under community connectedness. And I forgot that part of our goal is to connect parents with one another so they have a sense of community. And that wasn't anywhere in any of my language so far. So that was really helpful and just kind of like digging down deeper. Great, thank you so much, Stacy. And that's a great example of where the, the language that you use or the concepts behind your language might be really clear to you. You know what you wanna do. You know what this is all about for you. And yet there might be pieces of that that aren't self-evident to others and that you yourself might wanna remind yourself about. Um, and they're really important and they may happen in a sequence. So, you know, like you said, it's not just this whole thing about who is participating. But why? How do you help them get there? Um, what is what are the components of that, and what are ways to sustain that? So um, those are all great questions to ask yourself as you're doing this kind of thing, and to um, to just try to think about a little bit more detail about what those those big goals really are about. They can point you in different directions. Anybody else? I'll share. Um, Great. Hi, my hi. name is Tinu. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I work with NAMI, so I, and I'm new with NAMI, and I'm not in a program role, so I'm sort of piecing things together. So, you know, some of my logic model is based on uh, assumptions that I, you know, I, I don't know concretely if these are correct, but um one thing I wanted to say is really like the uh, starting with the long term and going backwards really helped me because I tend to get very lost in details. I'm somebody that gets really lost in the details easily. And so that really forced me to kind of hone it down to like, okay, start with like a single long term outcome and then kind of going upstream from there. I felt like that was really helpful in really narrowing down, um, sharpening that, that attention to, to a few details instead of too many. Um, so I can share what I wrote. Um, please, it's a, please it's do. A little, okay. So um, I'm going to read it back from the long term because that's the way I worked it. Okay. Sure. So long term, um, my long term change that I was hoping to see is uh, that people experiencing mental health conditions will seek care and resources without the fear or barrier of stigma. Mm -hmm. um, so the intermediate that led me to an intermediate outcome. Um, mental health care will be seen as normal, and that mental illness in general will be destigmatized, um, which is big. <laughs> and uh, mental health care will be accessible to anyone seeking care because in order for somebody you know, in that next bucket to, to be in that position, that's kind of flowing upstream what I thought would be necessary. And then going upstream from there, in order for that to be necessary, I wrote that um, sharing in public discourse and it, oh, that we need to be sharing about mental illness in public discourse. Um, it needs to be normalized in public and private spheres. So p within families, as well as within communities. Um, and also that money and policies uh, have to prioritize funding for mental health care. Uh, insurance needs to cover it, Medi-Cal, and there needs to be more access. Mm -hmm. um, and then going upstream a little farther, this would be our activities um, 
through our presentations in high schools, um, our support groups and our classes. We would seek to normalize um, mental illness and mental health care um, and show families how to speak to each other about it and how to support each other through it. Um, so that's one area. And then looking at the upstream for the funding aspect and the um, sort of public infrastructure for mental health care, um, our activity would be advocacy for resources. Great. Well, Danu, that's, you got a lot done in a few minutes. <laughs> Um, and, and thanks for the reminder that for some people, for a variety of reasons, either the way that you think or the information that you have at your disposal or where you are in the organization, it might be more helpful to start at the long-term end and work your way back or upstream, as you said, or starting with the activities and not getting bogged down and or overwhelmed by them, but moving those along that way. And Danu, at, at the outset, you mentioned um, that you were new to the organization, and so you were you had a lot of assumptions that you might need to test. Absolutely, a logic model would be a way to do that. So you can share that with other people and say, you know, I was thinking this. What do you guys think? Or what um, does this sound right? Or does this sound like does this sound feasible? Or is this the right sequence? Or somebody's one person's short-term outcome might feel more like an intermediate one to somebody else. You know, just doesn't, um, again, not, not, those aren't hard and fast lines, but just the discussion about what belongs where and what the sequence is, what needs to happen first in order for these other things to happen can be really great discussions inside an organization or with partners, not to mention with outsiders like grant reviewers or funders. So thanks for those examples and for sharing your work. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Okay. Well, did that raise any other questions or um, did, you, did you get stuck on any part of that that we could help with or um, we could help each other with? Did any part of it feel particularly easy or hard? So did anybody else start at the, at the long-term end like Danu did? Chris, you did? Great. Yeah, I found that very helpful. It just shifted everything, got me mm -hmm. out of that sort of overwhelm box mm -hmm. into, oh, ideally, this is what we're really working for. And it may seem like, you know, starting from that place of a really almost idealistic, long-term perfect goal, and then yeah. working back from there made it all flow much easier. Absolutely. And, and Chris, you know, the, the humorous um, slide that Nicole started the theory of change section with, that black box that's where the magic happens, you can think about the logic model as kind of pulling back the curtain on that too, because it's sort of that sometimes we jump from here are our resources and activities, and there's the long-term outcome at the other end of that box. And there's just not a lot of explanation of what's in the middle or what, what comes first and what comes next. So sometimes it does help to, to move from the long-term back to the short-term. Okay, let's see. And thank you, Serge. Thanks for helping us think about and verbalize the importance of our program to potential donors in a structured way. That's great. Yeah, that's a, a really, um, good way to use these kinds of tools. And you don't even have to call them a theory of change or a logic model. Um, if that feels too jargony or um, it's just, you know, our, our statement of purpose or the change we're trying to achieve or how we're doing what we do. So many ways to, to talk about it. And some of you probably have a lot of this written or thought through or done somewhere, but may not call it this or have it lined up in, in just this way. <laughs> Nicole, do you see Stacy's question in the chat about whether we have a backwards mapping template like the logic model worksheet? Um, I don't think we have one set up the same way but you could fill it in just in a different order. 
Yeah, I just when I couldn't remember the example you used, and I I thought oh, you, oh. I thought it had like a different structure to it, but maybe that's just my memory, and that the that the prompts I thought looked different, but maybe not. The if then statements were phrased slightly differently, so we could certainly take the logic model template and and plug in the the, the if thens are phrased slightly differently if you're starting from the long term outcome, so we can. We can add that to our yeah absolutely but and it's the same progression though of um knowledge attitude skills to behavior changes to status changes in status so if you think about it that way it's you know you start start with the things that you do have some influence or control over that you build on those to get to the next set of changes that are more difficult to achieve or more ambitious and require some persistence. And those lead to broader changes among a whole population, for example. So you're just doing that in, in the reverse order. If we wanted to see this change in an entire population among youth, for example, if we wanted to see the youth ready for life, college, and career, then what would they need to be doing? What, we, what would we need to help them change in their lives before that happens? And in order for that change to happen, what would we need to support them with um, and understand about their situation and motivate them? So whichever direction you go in, you're building, you're building from something more concrete and contained to something more ambitious. Um, so Pamela's got a question. When approaching donors, any rule of thumb on how much time to spend on the various stages of outcomes? Great question. So um, some donors really do want to know the detail. And it's an opportunity to explain the link between what you're doing now and what they might be funding now in the short term and how that contributes to a long-term outcome. And I think we all know um, funders historically have not necessarily invested in long-term change or they expect long-term change, but they don't invest in multiple years often. And so sometimes it's an opportunity to remind them that the links in this chain can be broken. Um, you know, that if the, the funding, the expectation for outcomes may not match the activities that are being funded. But if part of the effort here is to place some context around what you're doing. So you're not saying that you are gonna make all the youth in the county ready for life, college, and career. You're saying that, that your program through these activities and its focus on this population, maybe it's a school district, maybe it's an age group, maybe it's a group of kids who are not connected to school. Whatever your, your focus is, that, that is your contribution to this larger goal. It's not that you yourself are taking on that larger goal alone. And so when you think about it that way, maybe it leads to some ideas about who you would partner with, for example. Or maybe there's some ideas about starting small and expanding or, or what you want to learn at each stage of these outcomes um, and reassess what you're doing. And, and a board or a funder can be very helpful in those kinds of conversations as well, because those are assumptions that you can test and, um, and explore with more information. And, and how we learn about what we're doing, how we learn about when, when an outcome falls short, um, what we wanna do about that, um, how we portray that, th those are subjects of some upcoming trainings as well. So we'll get in, more into the weeds about, about all of these things. But um, the, in answer to your question, I hate to keep saying it depends, but it depends on what your funder is interested in. But if your funder persistently does not understand one of the links in this chain that you are um, that you feel strongly about, maybe this is an opportunity to bring understanding to that and shed some light on it. Does anybody else have ideas about that? You all talk to funders more than we do, probably. Chris, different question or? A different question um, because the whole funding is, aspect is very new to me. I've been program oriented, now I'm moving into that. So okay. I understand that the 
you know, the theory of change is the what and or the, the logic model is the what and the theory of change is the why. How do you, is there a procedure for sort of fitting those together? Is it two very different aspects of what you're putting together? Or are you supposed to weave them together? They should be, they should be um, intertwined. So they should make sense um, one to the other. So, so if your theory of change is that youth are not ready for um, life, career, et cetera, college, because of X that you're, and you're, you're addressing that X, um, then your theory of change, the activities that you're doing to address that, to make that hypothesis fit, are reflected in the logic model. You shouldn't have a theory of change that's at odds with your logic model or activities in your logic model that don't support your theory of change. They, they should really um, speak to each other. But the, in terms of a procedure, you know, the, the long-term outcomes should be reflected in the, um, the statement of the theory of change in the hypothesis. And, and some people start with the theory of change and then build the logic model around it. And other times you have a logic model for what you're doing and it is and it's forcing you to either reassess or develop a theory of change that you didn't have in place before. And that in turn might make you go back to your logic model and say, you know what, we didn't think about this, as Stacy said, we didn't think about this whole set of things that, um, that we now have some, some questions about or need to unpack in some way. So um, at the outset, Nicole mentioned, none of this is something that you would necessarily develop in a perfect way on the first try. And a lot of the value is in the puzzling it out and figuring out where, where it does make sense and where it might need a little bit more detail or explanation. And the confusion or lack thereof of the people you're sharing it with will tell you a lot. Does this make sense to others? A good question though. Thank you, that was very helpful. You're welcome. If I can add to, um, and I haven't, I haven't done this yet for myself, but if you look at the questions in the core application, like some of the questions you can clearly see, they kind of, they, again, it's not called a theory of change, it's not called a problem statement or context, but you can kind of see that's really what they're asking. Like, what is the issue? What's the need? Who are you, you know, trying to reach? Um, Why and so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so the more you've thought through a theory of change, the easier it'll be to then answer those kinds of questions. So you might even, like if you haven't done a theory of change before, or haven't created a logic model before, and maybe you've already started your applications or you're feeling like, I just need to start. <laughs> you might find even that you just go back and forth, right? As you're thinking through the application, and you're like, hmm, okay, why are we doing that? What is the need? then you might go to your theory of change worksheet to think through that set of questions around the problem and need statement and the context that might help you then answer that particular question or questions like that. There are questions asking you to describe your, basically your project proposal or your program. Like, what are you doing? Why do you think it will work? That's basically asking, do you have outcomes in mind? Are you basing your model on another program or practice that has been evaluated and uh, produce certain outcomes that you think are likely to uh, be something that you can replicate, you know, in your own program. So again, the application doesn't, doesn't ask those questions in exactly the way that we describe them in a theory of change and logic model, but that's basically what's asking you. That's why we do this training first, because, you know, however you work through the tools, if it's in a sequential order or you just... <laughs> Go to the, the pieces that make sense as you're working through things um, and do it with others that will that should definitely help you be able to think through your responses to the application. I'm gonna um, close us out here with, we just have a few minutes left and thank you all for the great questions and for sharing um, your progress here. And I, I really hope that, um, we both hope that you will find these helpful again, not just for this RFP, although of course that's the, the catalyst for these trainings, but just in general, um, both internally and externally. So let's talk about what else is coming up for just a moment again. Um, Nicole's gonna share another poll, and this time we wanna ask you again about rating your level of knowledge about 
developing a theory of change and a logic model, and then how likely you are to use these tools. So there are three questions total if you might need to scroll down. Okay. Just another few seconds. And while you're continuing to answer that poll, let's pull up some upcoming trainings that um, Gisela has also put into the chat. So you can see the links there to sign up for the, the trainings and the group office hours or for the one-on-one -on -one TA sessions that Nicole described earlier. So um, this is the second the repeat of the theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. And then we're moving on to using different core tools to develop your proposal. And then we'll have a session in January on refining program outcomes and evaluation tools using an equity lens. And then finally um, in January, using data and stories for continuous learning and improvement and for telling your own story. So um, those are all coming up through December and January. And we encourage you to participate live as you did today. You can, you can uh, sign up for one of the two repeated sessions or we're recording all of them and you're welcome to listen to them afterwards or share them with colleagues. And then finally, Nicole's deploying a feedback survey. And since we're doing these back to back, we really do pay attention to this feedback and we would really appreciate your thoughts on how this went. And we hope that we'll see you again soon. And good luck. <laughs>